Hello, I'm Tony Perkins with Washington Watch. Each day, this program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News update for today, Tuesday, March 19th. Well, it looks like Donald Trump has found himself in a tough spot as yesterday the former president's attorneys said he's been unable to secure the $454 million bond needed for his civil fraud judgment in New York. So far, they've approached 30 companies with no results, and Trump is now asking an appeals panel if he can avoid posting bond while he challenges the case. Should they refuse, though, New York AG Letitia James could start seizing Trump's properties as soon as the 25th of this month. Elsewhere, congressional leaders have apparently struck a deal, funding, a funding deal that is, for the Department of Homeland Security, even amid bitter divisions over the border crisis. Congress now has until Friday to pass the remaining six government funding bills to avoid a partial government shutdown, but there's likely going to be some pushback along the way. House conservatives like Texas Congressman Chip Roy say the plan directly funds the Biden administration's border policies. My Republican colleagues will side, side up, saddle up with Democrats to pass a funding bill that will fund all of those open borders. And then they'll try to go home and campaign, but I passed a resolution. But I passed a bill that was named after Lake and Riley. Aren't I great? Aren't I awesome? The answer to that question is no, you're not. You're not great. You're not awesome. Great and awesome is when you're willing to stand up and fight for the people you said you would fight for when you came here. And shifting gears a little bit, let's now go to FISM's Ian Patrick, who has some updates on the censorship case before the Supreme Court. Has the Biden administration gone too far in pressuring social media companies to censor certain content? It's certainly a question that we've explored via different reports and updates, but now the question is formally before the Supreme Court. The original case, titled Murthy v. Missouri, was filed back in May of 2022. The plaintiffs accused the Biden administration of coercing social media platforms to censor talking points that they don't agree with. They allege that the platforms violated the First Amendment in doing so. The Biden administration, however, countered that it was exercising its right to request the removal of what it believed to be content that harmed public health. Both liberal and conservative justices on the high court seemed skeptical of the original argument to begin with. Each side raised concerns that restricting contact between the government and social media platforms could actually hinder officials' ability to remove harmful content. And shifting gears to uh, international news, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has now agreed to send a delegation to Washington in the coming days to discuss the war in Gaza. President Biden made that request yesterday during the first call between the two leaders in more than a month. Here's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan with those details. On the call today, President Biden asked the Prime Minister to send a senior interagency team composed of military, intelligence, and humanitarian officials to Washington in the coming days to hear U.S. concerns about Israel's current Rafah planning and to lay out an alternative approach that would target key Hamas elements in Rafah and secure the Egypt-Gaza border without a major ground invasion. The U.S. and other Western allies have been pressuring Israel not to invade Rafah, though the administration does say that Biden still supports Israel's goal of destroying Hamas. And the president has repeatedly made the point that continuing military operations need to be connected to a clear strategic endgame. The president told the prime minister again today that we share the goal of defeating Hamas, but we just believe you need a coherent and sustainable strategy to make that happen. And those are today's headlines from FISM News. Once again, I'm Samuel Case. And don't forget, you can watch our full show tonight. That'll be at 5 p.m. Eastern time on FISMnews.tv. Stay tuned for Washington Watch with Tony Perkins. I'll see you tomorrow with more news.
From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch. Broadcasting from the heart of our nation's capital, we bring you the latest insights, analysis, and interviews on the most pressing issues facing you and your family. So, for the next hour, we'll navigate the conflict and complexities of our nation's capital with clarity, integrity, and a relentless pursuit of truth. Washington Watch starts now. At the end of 20 years, we, the military, helped build an army, a state, but we could not forge a nation. The enemy occupied Kabul, the overthrow of the government occurred, and the military we supported for two decades faded away. That is a strategic failure. That was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, retired General Mark Milley, testifying before the House Foreign Affairs Committee today regarding the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Florida Congressman Mike Waltz, a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and a combat veteran, will join us shortly. Then we'll delve into yesterday's First Amendment case and where the Supreme Court may land on it. Some might say that the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country, and you seem to be suggesting that that duty cannot manifest itself in the government encouraging or even pressuring um, platforms to take down harmful information. That was Justice Katanji Brown Jackson suggesting yesterday that the government may need to silence people in order to protect them. Wow. This is an important issue with far-reaching implications for free speech. We'll uh, dissect it further with Louisiana Governor Jeff Landry, who, as the former Attorney General of Louisiana, spearheaded this suit along with uh, against the Biden administration, along with the Attorney General of Missouri. He joins us in studio later. We recently discussed the shocking revelation of documents leaked from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, exposing the fact that WPATH is controlled by gender ideologues who ignore scientific evidence. Well, there has been a quiet development. Meg Kilgannon will join us to explain. Finally, we'll address the critical question of how Bible-believing Christians should respond when elected leaders betray the truth. We have a moral obligation. I don't care whether you're governor or whether you are a housewife or whether you are a business owner, whether you're a teacher or whether you are whatever capacity you serve. We always have a higher moral obligation to the, to the Word of God and God's standard than man's law. And whenever man's law is in contradiction to the higher standard, we better take the higher standard every time. That was Pastor Gary Hamrick of Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia, this past Sunday, responding to Governor Glenn Youngkin signing a same-sex marriage bill into law. Pastor Gary joins us later. Well, as we dive into today's issues, remember the bedrock principles that guide us here at Washington Watch, faith, family, and freedom. And these are not just words, but values that form the very foundation of our nation. Well, earlier today, two of the nation's top former military officials testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee to discuss the Biden administration's withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan back in August of 2021. Now, that withdrawal, notably, has been viewed by many as the first domino to fall in a series of foreign policy failures that exposed President Biden's weakness to the rest of the world. Now, this administration would rather we forget about what uh, happened, but they cannot escape the reality that the world is on fire, and that fire appears to be spreading. Under the Biden administration, they have evacuated more U.S. embassies th than any other administration in history. Now we're looking at Haiti. Cuba is on the verge. Joining me now to talk about this and much more, Congressman Mike Waltz, he joins us by phone. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He represents the 6th Congressional District of Florida. He's also a combat decorated Green Beret with multiple combat tours in Afghanistan. Colonel, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, thank you, Tony. and. Um always good to be with you, but one of these days we're going to hopefully have something uh, more positive to talk about than these disasters 
going on around the world. Well, th this is a reminder that elections have consequences as we, we see the, f the world on fire, as I, I mentioned, and it seems to be spreading. But let's start with today's hearing. What did we learn? I mean, you have uh, met with uh, General Milley many times. He's testified before you multiple times. Any new information about that chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan come forth today? Yeah, I'd say the things um, I'd say the things that were new and things that were validated uh, was that the Defense Department, uh, including three four-star generals, uh, General Milley is chairman, General McKenzie is the commander of all forces in the Middle East, and General Miller, the commander out in Afghanistan, uh, a, uh, recommended a couple of things. One, they rec we keep <laughs> Bagram Air Base. They recommended that we keep a small group of uh, special forces there to keep going after al Qaeda and support the Afghans, and that President Biden not only disregarded that recommendation, uh, he stood before the American people and lied about it and said the generals never told him that. So we refuted that today in public and on the record. Uh, President uh, Biden also told the American people that they were repeatedly that there were only a hundred Americans that wanted to get out that were left behind. That's a hundred too many, of course. But General Milley said they didn't really know how many Americans uh, were there. It was it was impossible uh, to figure out at the time. Yet again, Biden and Blinken were saying no, no. It's, it was it was only a hundred. And I'd say the the biggest piece, Tony, was that the military repeatedly warned the State Department and the White House that Afghanistan was going to crumble, uh, that, um, that we had to get our civilians, American citizens, our embassy and our allies out, uh, and those warnings were ignored, uh, and that the State Department ignored them up until the fall of Kabul and then suddenly reversed course and told the military to try to clean it all up, and we saw sadly, the chaos that ensued. Uh, and as this is all coming out today, Gold Star families from Abbey Gate uh, are literally sitting in the audience in tears, including uh, Mr. Steve Nakui, the gentleman that was so upset he yelled out at Biden and was subsequently arrested and charged, which is a whole other issue. So, uh, Mike, what you're saying is that based on today's evidence or today's testimony, we now know that the Biden administration ignored the recommendations of its military leaders. Now, we're left with only assuming that they put political decisions above military and strategic decisions, and the loss of that, uh, not only in Afghanistan, but around the world, continues. That's right. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I think it's something that we all instinctively know, uh, but it is something altogether to get the just retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the commander of all forces in the Middle East, to say on record uh, that their advice was ignored, uh, that they repeatedly put plans forward to get our allies, our citizens out, and they were denied, uh, and that, um, as a consequence, we have 13 Americans dead. We had Americans left behind. We have our allies, our Afghan allies, still being hunted by the Taliban. Uh, we have Al Qaeda and ISIS that are festering and growing again. And we sent the signal to the entire world uh, that America could be defeated by jihadis. And uh, we have the world on fire as a result. And all of that, validated by these generals, was as a result of bad policymaking in this White House and in this State Department. Well, I, I want to ask you a question about the hearing today, because I saw a tweet that uh, you put out from the hearing. Uh, there were a lot of empty seats, uh, not in the audience, but among the, the panel of the members of Congress. Where were the Democrats? Yeah, uh, you know, I was, I'm not advocating for my own uh, uh, Twitter, but go to Michael G. Waltz, uh, and because the visual is sad. Uh, but it's powerful. And you will see a hearing room with literally one half full, uh, the Republican side, and the entire other half, minus one or two, uh, uh, completely empty on the Democratic side. It, it, uh, and getting accountability and understanding what happened 
uh, should not be a partisan issue. But, you know, look, I mean, this is just goes to show the length, I guess, that that people will do to to ignore the issue or, I guess, just to run away from bad bad decision making politically. They didn't want to be there. Right. I, I think that it's, they think they can bury their head in the sand, and ignore the realities. But it's there. And we're seeing it as we talked about the world being on fire. Haiti. I mean, this is another place that, um, you know, we're not directly involved in that, but our policies have implications around the world. I mean, we've seen 11 embassies partially or totally uh, w where we've had to withdraw personnel, emergency orders given for them to leave the countries more than any other administration. How else do you explain that? Well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates. Uh, you know, said, look, uh, Biden may be a guy you, you wouldn't mind having a beer with, but he's been wrong on every single foreign policy decision for the last three decades. Uh, and they just keep getting it wrong. And as a consequence, uh, peace through strength has crumbled. American leadership is not respected and or feared. Uh, and you are seeing everything from criminal gangs in Haiti to uh, our greatest adversaries, China and Russia, on the march. Right. And, um, you know, this is what the world will look like. God help, Tony. And I yeah. pray about this every night if we have another five years with, with Joe Biden in that White House or really an empty seat in that White House. Yeah. You know, we've we've talked many times about China. You and I share a great concern about China. But I, I, I want to before we run out of time here, ask you about Haiti. What are you hearing? What's going on there? Well, fortunately, I was able to get briefed by our, our southern command uh, down in Miami just late last week. Uh, you know, there's two key components. There's the safety of Americans on the ground and our embassy. I think our military has the right things in place to take care of our embassy. But, Tony, if they have to start getting thousands of Americans, which was the situation, you know, we faced other places, they're going to need something to in chief to give them the call before it becomes a total crisis, uh, which, again, was the lesson, one of the lessons from today's hearing on Afghanistan. You wait until it's too late and the bad guys have completely taken over. And then, of course, the other piece is the migrant uh, issue. And um, look, it is getting really desperate and really bad. Florida's coastline is just as long as the Texas southern border. And I don't want Florida to look like our southern border. So we are pressing hard to make sure the Coast Guard, the Navy, uh, our, and our law enforcement have the right assets. And I have a bill that just went through committee. I'm trying to get it out of the House now that would double the amount of territory uh, our maritime uh, Customs and Border Patrol agents uh, can can patrol so they can intercept these migrants before they get to our shores. A lot going on. And again, underscores elections have consequences. Congressman Mike Waltz, always great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Yes, sir. Uh, we're, we're in the fight. And thanks so much. All right. Congressman Mike Waltz, I said see you. I actually hear him. He's joining us by phone because they're uh, just voting on the House floor. All right, coming up next, we're uh, scheduled to be joined by the governor of Louisiana, Jeff Landry. We're going to get his take on yesterday's case that was heard before the Supreme Court regarding the Biden administration leaning on social media platforms to silence critics. They say uh, people are putting out disinformation when, in fact, the evidence now suggests that it not suggests. The evidence tells us it was the Biden administration putting out disinformation. But how might the court rule on this? We're going to talk with the governor of Louisiana, Jeff Landry, next. So don't go away. We're coming back with more Washington Watch after this. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign. Righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. 
We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now, now. Let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Be sure and check it out. Lots of resources there for you. Well, yesterday we had on the program Missouri's Attorney General Andrew Bailey to talk about the oral arguments at the Supreme Court over the challenge to the Biden administration's social media censorship efforts. Well, the other leader in that challenge was Louisiana's then Attorney General Jeff Landry, who last fall was elected to serve as the state's 57th governor. He's also my governor. And he's here with me now in studio to give his take on yesterday's arguments and more. Governor Landry, welcome to Washington Watch. Well, Tony, great to see you. I haven't seen you since the inauguration. That's right. That's right. I got some it's... great pictures of you, too, by the way, that I owe you. Well, good. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. I know you've been busy. I've been busy. Um, but you came here to D.C. to be in the court yesterday to hear the oral arguments in this case that uh, you and uh, the Attorney General of Missouri pursued your thoughts? Yeah, look, uh, both Sharon and I went to the court. Uh, certainly, I wanted to go and support our new Attorney General, Liz Muro, uh, who I think is going to do a fantastic job in Louisiana on a case that you write that we started, uh, both myself and then Attorney General Eric Schmidt, who's now a U.S. senator, um, where we had believed, uh, like many other uh, Americans, like probably thousands or tens of thousands of Americans, if not millions, uh, that during the pandemic and during the election cycle, their voices on their social media pages were being silenced and that we believed that the government was involved in doing that as well. And so we filed this lawsuit um, under the, the presumption that the government cannot entice or coerce or force a private actor to do that which they cannot do, um, such as violate a, a, a citizen's First Amendment. And, uh, you know, a lot of people thought this case would go nowhere. Uh, Judge Doty took the case and did a great job, you know, gave us some room for discovery. We found out all kind of things, right? We found out that, in fact, the government knew uh, that possibly uh, the virus the COVID-19 virus came out of a, a lab in Wuhan. Um, we found out that the FBI knew that they had the Hunter Biden laptop and the New York Post article was not, in fact, um, Russian propaganda. So, so the misinformation was actually coming from the government. Correct. <laughs> correct. That's correct. We found, I mean, we just found out countless things. And, and you know, Judge Doty in, at, in the district court in Louisiana enjoined the government from continuing down this path. The Fifth Circuit took the case up. They agreed with him in part, narrowed the injunction a bit, 
And then the Supreme Court stayed that injunction and took the case up, and we heard it yesterday. The, the troubling part about yesterday's hearing, and of course I didn't get an, an opportunity to hear you and General Bailey's comments or his, his, his position, but what was troubling was how many of the justices who I thought could have understood or grasped the First Amendment and the government coercing social media to, 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 to censor Americans, um, their questioning just didn't seem in line with that. So, Governor Landy, I want to play, I want to actually play a clip of uh, uh, Justice uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, who I think reveals the left's misunder, or actually, I think, disregard for the First Amendment. Play clip number three. Some might say that the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country, and you seem to be suggesting that that duty cannot manifest itself in the government encouraging or even pressuring uh, platforms to take down harmful information. So, if I understand what she's saying, the government has a right to silence you so they can protect you. Well, let me tell you, sitting next to me was Congressman Jim Jordan and Dan Bishop. And when she made that comment, I thought Jim was going to get out, get up and walk out. Uh, because you're right, it, it, it was shocking. Uh, I don't know where she reads into either the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights where the federal government has a duty to infringe upon any American's civil rights or Bill of Rights, anything inside the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, it's there for a reason. Well, exactly. It's there to protect us from, from the, the government, government. Exactly. doing exactly that. And, and you know, she continued to harp on, well, you know, what if there's a compelling interest? But she seemed to gloss over the fact that before you can ask the question as to whether the government has a compelling interest to infringe upon your constitutional rights, you first must find that the government violated your constitutional rights, right? That's that's the first question. But she seemed to say that, listen, the government should have carte blanche to be able to infringe upon your constitutional right if the government feels right. that they could And in the right. facts in this case, as we talked about earlier, show that the government was wrong. They were the ones putting out disinformation. Exactly. And the fact that the justices didn't, or it seemed to be maybe that some of the justices who we thought were more um, favored towards supporting the First Amendment, um, couldn't grasp that, w w was a bit troubling. But look, I, you know, I would hope that the line of questioning was simply to clear up some things, and, and maybe they did understand it. We will see. But I can tell you this, Tony. It is the most important First Amendment case in the last hundred years. There, there is no doubt that whatever the court does in this case is going to have an impact on American citizens and the relationship of the First Amendment to them. So oftentimes when the court will ask these questions, it, it goes a different direction. So you, you, so. you, you can't always read no, into right. that. But might there be legislation that could come forth with all of the information that you've gathered through the discovery on this process? Yeah, I mean, look, the Congress could absolutely step in. I mean, look, it showed, I have been saying all along that Section 230 is problematic. Okay, that, that, that's the section that, that gives the social media platforms immunity from being sued by private actors for whatever reason. Correct. In my opinion, at this point in time, those that's a special status, by the way. That's a special status. right. One which which this broadcast does not enjoy, right? right? One which TV broadcasts, radio, and so don't say and, anything. I'll get sued. Right. Well, that's right. that's why I'm here. I'm your lawyer too, <laughs> right? But not, not anymore. I'm the governor. I can't give you a lawyer. But look. <laughs> You're exactly right. That's why I've been advocating for the fact that what should happen is those platforms should be dropped into the same regulatory bracket as absolutely as broadcast. Absolutely. I mean, why is it that a little bitty radio station in you know Monroe, Louisiana, uh, has to watch exactly what they put on or not, and, can't, and the government can't call? And then the social media is they just it's have a, free reign. Initially, it was to get them started to help them. But now they're the giants. They don't need that special protection anymore. I agree. I agree. All right, Governor, we're out of time. I'll well, see you back in Baton Rouge. All right, sure. Thank you for giving me some of your time, and uh, thank you to all your listeners out there as well. Always great to see you. Take care. Governor Jeff Landry. I'll see him back in Louisiana. All right, coming up, the World Professional Association for Transgender, WPATH, is... Uh, feeling the heat for the latest edition of its standards of care for gender-confused individuals. 
We're going to talk about uh, what actions they might be taking as a result of an explosive leak of documents recently. Stick around. More Washington Watch straight ahead. Thank you again for these dear friends and those who serve, who you've called here to serve. We've heard their hearts this morning, God. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you give us all wisdom, discernment, stamina to do the things that you have called us to do. And as Solomon asked, and as we repeat, Lord, that you would give us the courage to walk in your ways, to follow your commands, and to stand for truth so that we can govern and administer justice in a way that is pleasing and honorable to you. We ask and pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. Amen. above all names by which we must be saved, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the only answer, the only hope America has that it might yet again shine as a city on a hill. No revival comes without repentance. So God, we pray that we would own our own sin. God, that we'd walk before you in constant revival. What have we done to our children? We are teaching them that there's no God and that they can define good and evil. Lord, have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would commission us to go and make your word known and your truth to a world that is in desperate need of that truth and that hope. Lord, I pray that we would answer the call and say, here we are. Send us in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Washington Watch, and I'm Tony Perkins, your host. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Be sure and check it out. By the way, still praying for Israel. I'm back, and thanks for praying because really jet lag hasn't hit me. Maybe it's still coming, but... Um, if you'd like to join us in praying for Israel, text the word Israel to 67742. That's 67742. We're still working on a lot of stuff. I'm going to share some of that in the coming days with you, some plans we're working on to encourage the church to stand with Israel in response to uh, actually a request from the Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu when I met with him. All right, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin is not the only public figure facing backlash on matters related to the radical LGBTQ XYZ lobby. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health, more commonly known as WPATH, is feeling some heat too. Controversy has plagued its eighth edition of Standards of Care for the gender confused, which removed age restrictions on sex change treatments for patients. Now, online sleuths have uncovered that the newest edition has been quietly removed from their website. Now, is this a sign of reform based upon the leaked documents that expose their ideological bent that ignores science, or are they just waiting for the storm to pass? Here to uh, share more details, Meg Kilgannon, Senior Fellow for Education Studies at Family Research Council. Meg, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right, so what's the deal? So before I was going to come on, I checked the WPATH website just to be sure, and uh, it is different than it was before these files were released, but the standard of uh, care version 8 documents are right back up on the front page. So, so they take them down to edit them? They took put, them, put them down and put them back up. I haven't looked through them, so I don't know if they were edited. But um, they're claiming that there's uh, internal web problems happening right now. But it's curious that something like that would happen following the release of the of the Okay, WPS so files. for the benefit of our listeners who may not have been listening a week ago, actually a week before last when mm -hmm. we talked about this, the leaked documents, what did it expose? So the leaked documents um, exposed a lot of um, sloppiness, a lot of careless talk, uh, a lot, uh, a lack of real concern over some serious issues related to the procedures. So WPATH is kind of like the organization that spearheads pushing 
policies that allow for transgender surgeries. Right. Many right. of them, as I read through the documents that were leaked, suggested they knew that what they were proposing was experimental, yes. had health implications. But that didn't seem to, to slow them down. No, it doesn't slow them down because I think politically what they're doing is creating a constituency so that they can develop this area of law called transgender rights. And so what better, more sympathetic group than children who have been affirmed in the wrong sex, right? They're, they've been treated to be the gender they're not, the sex right. that they're not. Um, so you have adults uh, using children for their own political and sexual agendas is what this is. This leak, these leaked documents, pretty explosive in revealing that this yes. is an organization driven by ideologues. Many of the experts are actually transgender themselves, so they're not going to have second thoughts about whether it's a good thing or not. Right. Um, is this going to lead to some reform of policy? Well, that is really what we're all waiting to see, because the WPATH files are the basis for the recommendations from the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, et cetera, et cetera. All the main uh, medical groups rely on WPATH for their uh, standards of care. And that means that school systems across the country rely on those organizations to inform their policies. Yeah. So until some of the major medical groups pull back from WPATH, um, things won't change very much. But we are hopeful that the that continuing media coverage of this will make that happen. All right, I want to shift gears very quickly to a topic that um, our listeners have probably never heard me talk about, and that's RuPaul and the <laughs> drag race. That's not cars. Uh, that's drag queens and mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, involved in some controversy with sexual exploitation and sexual, uh, actually, crime. Right. One of the stars of the show has been accused by multiple people of sexual misconduct. And um, the report is made in the Rolling Stone, which we have to admit doesn't have the greatest track record when they bring up issues of sexual misconduct. But um, in digging into this story, it, it just sort of pulled a few things, strings together for me on this topic. One of the pieces of legislation, the anti-trans, as the left likes to characterize it, legislation that they've been putting forward has been to try to eliminate drag, drag shows in public. And it's been RuPaul's Drag Show and this show on HBO, We're Here, those shows being on television in out there for the public to consume, normalize this right. to the degree that it's not seen as something controversial. And so it's very difficult for, for people who don't want to have the sexual content out in the public square, out in the real world, not just on a screen, but being performed live for to have people be able to push back on that. But really, should we be surprised that sexual perversion leads to perverse activity? We should not. Yeah. I mean, th th this is, th they, they want to put a false facade, a facade on it right. to make it look all family friendly and yes. they want to go after the kids. But really, it is drawing them deeper into a perverse world that runs counter to the truth of God. Yes, indeed. Meg Kilgannon, thanks for, uh, for joining me. Thanks for having me. All right. All right, folks, after the break, Pastor Gary Hamrick will join me talking about biblical truth. We're going to talk about how Christians, Bible-believing Christians, should respond when our elected, a leader, our elected leaders betray the truth. We're going to talk about that next with Pastor Gary Hamrick. Don't go away. We're back with more Washington Watch after this. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of Family Research Council. Sometimes the headlines are overwhelming and it feels like we're alone and there's nothing we can do. That is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. Reading through the Bible, there are many things that are counterintuitive. One of them is that God never uses a majority. It is always a minority devoted to the truth. Here at Family Research Council, we're grateful to stand side by side with other believers for the truth. And as a result, God is making a difference. When you partner with us, you're joining with Christians around the nation and standing together for the truth of God's word. Supplying pastors and parents and school boards with training and resources to stand up against the indoctrination of your children. 
I invite you to become a stand member and stand with FRC today. Together, with God's help, we can preserve freedom for the next generation. Go to frc.org and become a stand member today. Again, that's frc.org. Stand with us. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. I'm Tony Perkins, and I have a prediction. This year, there will be uncertainty and continued political and cultural division. Okay, so that's not that startling of a prediction. But try this. We can have peace and even joy amid the chaos. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus told us there would be days like this so that our eyes would be upon him and his promises rather than our circumstances. Now, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Abide in Him by being in His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. With just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But most importantly, you'll be abiding in Him daily, living in His joy and peace in these trying times. Join me on this journey through the Bible. Go to frc.org slash Bible for more. Thanks for tuning in for this Tuesday edition of Washington Watch. Hey, men, if you live around New Jersey, there's still time for you to join us for FRC Stand Courageous Men's Conference this Saturday in Parsippany, New Jersey. It's, uh, it's almost sold out, but there are a few tickets still available. So go to StandCourageous.com. That's StandCourageous.com. And join us for our men's conference this coming Saturday. Our word for today comes from Numbers chapter 18. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil. And you shall serve. I give your priesthood as a gift. Now don't miss this. Aaron and his sons were given a gift of the priesthood. They were given the exalted position and the opportunity to serve and minister before the Lord. The ability to serve God is a gift. It's not a burden or an obligation. It is indeed a privilege to serve the Lord. You say, well, how does that apply to us? For those who have received the gift of salvation and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, we have been given the position of the priesthood. Peter writes, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So open your gift and serve the Lord. To find out more about joining us on our daily journey through the Bible, and I invite you to do so, you can uh, find out by texting BIBLE to 67742. That's BIBLE to 67742. It's one text that will transform your life. Well, in a move that surprised those on the right as well as those on the left, Republican Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin earlier this month signed into law HB 174, which establishes for the first time in Virginia state code the formal recognition and enforcement of so-called same-sex marriage. The decision prompted the pastor of one of the largest churches in Northern Virginia to reach out to the governor, who had spoken at the church a number of times. What explanation did the governor give and what can pastors glean from this? And how should we as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, respond when our leaders betray the truth. Joining me now to discuss this is the senior pastor of that church, Pastor Gary Hamrick of Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia. Pastor Gary, welcome back to Washington Watch. 
Thanks, Tony. Always good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, to, to set the stage, can, can you tell us about your relationship with the governor prior to the decision to sign HB 174? Well, I have always advocated for uh, putting in front of our congregation candidates running for office who most closely al aligns with our biblical worldview and our biblical values. Now, of course, Jesus is not running for office, so he's the only perfect candidate. But I always try to encourage our congregation, vote, like don't sit this out every election. And in Virginia, we have an election every single year for some office. And so I had um, then um, Glenn Youngkin before he became governor, then candidate Youngkin, uh, to our church three separate occasions um, to visit with us, to worship with us. By his request, he came. And as a believer, I was happy to put him forward in front of our congregation. So I, I knew him before the election. And even the, the night that he won, he had me to go out before he gave his acceptance speech and uh, pray. And so I did that as well. So we've had a, a, a standing relationship for the past uh, couple of years. I, I think one of the first times he was at the church uh, was when Cornerstone hosted our Pray Vote Stand Summit. Um, he That's right. He actually came there and spoke at the summit and, and talked to uh, those that were there for the Pray Vote Stand Summit. And I think the next, sun, the next day, that was a Saturday, I think the next day he spoke at the church that next morning as well. Um, so how do you deal with disappointments like this? I mean, clearly this is something that's not a gray area. And you addressed it this Sunday uh, before your congregation. Uh, Bottom line, as believers, even though the cultural currents may be headed one direction, we, we have to stand firm on, on the Word of God. That is the final arbiter of right and wrong for us. Yeah, and just to be clear, um, you know, I had a conversation with the governor, and he was gracious enough to reply to my texts. He sent a personal letter from me and our congregation, which I read. And um, and then he, and he called me uh, to discuss the letter, and and to be to be fair, to be clear, his position is that this is only um, acknowledging what the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decided with the Obergefell case that same-sex marriage is acceptable in all 50 states, and then he added some protection for pastors and for churches. And so, you know, his his position is this only speaks to marriage licenses, not the marriage ceremony itself. The bottom line, though, Tony, is what what I said to the governor, what I told our congregation on Sunday as a believer for him to put his signature to a law, making it law that is a clear violation of the higher moral standard of God's law. That's where I strongly disagree with what he did. And for believers to, you know, know that he's done this, it felt like a betrayal. It felt like, well, we thought that he was going to govern in a way that was consistent with our biblical values. And on this one, in my opinion, and in that of a lot of folks like yourself, he got this one wrong. He's still a brother. Yeah. Um, again, he's, he, you know, he's not a perfect person. We're all flawed, but he got this one wrong. And I just tell our folks, this is a good reminder Put your confidence in the Lord, not in a political leader. They will sometimes disappoint. I, as a pastor, will sometimes disappoint. Like, we are we are flawed people, and so keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the bottom line message. There's a little bit more to this, and it's how you responded to it. Uh, you know, it's one thing when we see elected leaders, and, and, and it happens. Look, I've been around this for 30-some years, and so I, I've seen it more than once. But... It is, when we have relationships with people, we should reach out and have conversations. And this is where I think the role of pastors are so important because now, while he did not change this, this law is in effect now, I, I do think that next time he's going to be a little more cautious. I, I've actually encountered that myself and that I've contacted, in, in fact, on this very same issue, not, not in Virginia, but elsewhere, that the uh, elected official in in, in, uh, in in the particular case I was dealing with um, said, you know what, I just I, I just wasn't thinking through it. I should have called next time, you know, when there's an issue like this, I will. And I think part of it is helping people walk through this and understanding where how God speaks with clarity 
to so many of these issues. Because downstream from Governor Yunkin is going to be mm -hmm. a teacher, going to be a police officer, a fireman who is a believer and understands the word of God is supreme. They may lose their job as a result of what the governor did. And, and what's, you know, what, what's uh, sometimes shocking is that you see more courage in yeah. those firemen, those policemen, those teachers. Well, let, we let, me, let me give you a perfect example, if I can. Sorry to interrupt, but I no. mean, I got actually an email from a county clerk who attends our church after I made this announcement. And she said, I'm going to have to find another job because one of the things, unfortunately, that HB 174 did was it did not provide a conscience clause for people like county clerks who are issuing these marriage licenses. So for me as a pastor, there's there's a bit of religious protection, although I don't think that it's all that solid, to be honest with you. Uh, Governor McDonald put in DOMA, and then Attorney General Mark Herring came along years later and said, ignore it. I think sometimes what gets in place is only as good as the administration. Right. But this county clerk said to me, I gotta get a new job because now I'm forced under this law to sign these marriage licenses. So. It is concerning on multiple levels. But this brings up the bigger issue here, Pastor Gary, and that is what is religious freedom? Yeah. Religious freedom is not just for pastors and for churches. That's right. It is for the American people, for, for that right. clerk, for that police officer, for that fireman, for that teacher. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're doing here is we're allowing, and this is what the governor facilitated by putting you know, that very limited language in there, is truncating this fundamental freedom that actually was first recognized there in Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. And, and, and so I think th this is where we have to educate both our people and elected leaders. Yeah, because it's not just a contradiction of Scripture, which it is. I mean, Jesus made it clear in Genesis 2.24, and Jesus, uh, uh, sorry, the Lord made it clear, God made it clear in Genesis 2.24, Jesus restates it in right. Mark chapter 10, that for this cause shall a man leave a father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one. On this issue of same-sex marriage, I mean, it's clear in God's word. This is not a political issue. This is a biblical issue, and so it's so disheartening when when the governor signed this and just gave another stamp of approval on same-sex marriage and and yet you're right what what we're dealing with across the country and it's not just in virginia is to maintain religious liberty that our founding fathers enshrined in the first amendment and um and it's and it's being threatened right now across our country in multiple ways and this is just one example here in virginia but people across the country are facing different challenges on the job related to religious freedom. And um, it's a battle that has continued to increase, and I don't think it's going to be going away anytime soon. Okay, Pastor Gary, let me ask you this question. I know you addressed this on Sunday in your uh, your message, but there were some say, you see, that's why we should not get involved in politics, you know, because you're going to be disappointed. They're going to do things that are not right. So you just need to stay out of it. Yeah. Well, and I did mention this on Sunday because I, I anticipated the question might be, is this going to dissuade you from introducing candidates uh, at church? And my answer was, no, it's not going to dissuade me because we still have to stay in the fight just because from time to time a, a political leader might let us down. And, and as the case here recently with HB 174 does not mean that we check out. I mean, if anything, it means we have to be even more vigilant because I have to be honest with you, Tony, I when when I when this happened, I asked myself, how much have I been praying for my governor? Because um, to be honest, sometimes what happens is when we vote for a person who's super close to our biblical values, I mean, Glenn Youngkin's a brother, he's a believer. It's easy for us as the church to check out and to sit back and go, well, we got this now because we have, quote, one of ours in office. And that makes us lazy as Christians. And then we get a candidate in there that we don't like and has terrible policies. And then we step up our prayer life. Why is that? It's terrible. I felt convicted myself. You know, I should have been praying for him more. I shouldn't have been as relaxed to think we got a candidate on our team in the in the office there so we're good to go so christians have to stay engaged i don't care who's in the white house or who's in the governor's mansion we have to stay engaged and we have to be prayerful that's what the bible tells us 
to pray for kings and all those in authority that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And we have to stay vigilant because the, the Lord's on the throne and we have to put our confidence in him and not who sits in that political seat. Right, and our role is, to, as you said, to uphold, uphold them. But like Aaron yeah. and her lifting up the arms of That's those right. that God has put. In fact, earlier in the program, I had my governor from Louisiana on the program, uh, Jeff Landry, and I pray for him almost every day. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, we need to pray more for the good guys because yeah. they are constantly under attack and the burden that they carry, and I know uh, you know, I know from personal experience and from walking with many of them, the, the, the burden that they carry, the forces that come against them, because we're in the spiritual battle. And these forces of, of evil uh, are unrelenting. But, but I want to underscore something else as you had this conversation, and I commend you for reaching out to Governor Young and having that conversation, having that relationship. You know, as you, you pointed out in your Sunday sermon, we're all human, we all fail, and we're to forgive. And of course, part of that forgiving is confronting, having the conversation. And then we, we, we continue. We don't ditch the relationship. We don't say, oh, right. I'm not having anything else to do with you because right. you did this. And it, it is egregious. I'm not in any way minimizing signing a same-sex marriage bill into law. This is a huge deal. But we, we, yeah. we, can, we can move forward. We cannot just say... Yeah. Right. Nothing well, to do with well, you. That, that's what the liberal culture does. It's the cancel culture. And right. Christians can't be doing that to each other. We can't, uh, you know, shoot our wounded. Um, we might have disagreements and we can have debates and discussions as I did with the governor. And again, I'm, I'm just thankful that he that he picked up the phone to call me to discuss it. Um, but, yeah, I'm I still I pray for him more than than I have. Um, because I've learned from this one, like what we need to really lift him up in prayer. And we don't we don't shun a brother or sister. We have disagreements and we press on and we fight for what is right. But somebody once told me that speaking the truth is the highest form of respect. And I showed my respect to my governor and I shared the truth with him and he heard me. And I pray, like you said, that maybe it'll go a long ways to second guessing or thinking more carefully about um, another matter that might come up in a similar way. Well, I, again, uh, Pastor Gary, commend you f for doing that because that, that is communicating. And I know, again, from personal experience, when you take the time to speak truth for the benefit of the individual you're speaking truth to, it goes a long way in building and solidifying that relationship and helping them in the future make more biblically sound decisions. So, Pastor Gary, greatly appreciate you and Cornerstone for all you do in upholding truth in our nation. Thank you, Tony. Mutual respect for our Family Research Council. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great day. Pastor Gary Hamrick, senior pastor, Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia. You know, I hear people all the time say, oh, I just, we need more pastors. We need more pastors like Gary, Pastor Jack. And there's, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them. And I thank God for those pastors who are willing to engage in a process that involves fallen human beings, and it's sometimes messy. But that doesn't mean that we ditch our responsibility. No, we continue on being salt and light. All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us today. Lord willing, we'll be back again tomorrow, and I pray you will as well. But until then, I leave you once again with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.